<laughs> Welcome to another Taxes in Retirement Live. Thank you all for joining. This one will be about the uh, exceptions to the 10% early withdrawal penalty you otherwise have to pay if and when you take money out of a tax deferred uh, IRA prior to age 59 and a half. Um, I'll also talk about a few points of uh, early withdrawal exceptions that apply to what's called employer plans, you know, tax deferred employer plans like 401ks, 403bs, uh, and so forth. Um, dad jokes. Let me get with some dad jokes. Let's see here. I have some good ones this week, or at least I think they're good. A bossy man goes into a bar. He orders everyone around. You do that, you do that. I like it. Wordplay. It's my favorite. Uh, just got offered a job teaching poetry in prison. Spent all night thinking about the pros and cons. Pros as in P-R-O-S-E and cons. Another good one. <clears throat> and finally, the first rule of passive aggressive is, uh, you know what? Never mind. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Get it? Because that's passive aggressive. Um, there we go. Okay, so I see a comment. Good. Cody says nice. Thank you, Cody. I know comments are working. Let me get the disclosure out of the way. This video is only general explanations and education. It's not specific tax, legal, or investment advice. Before considering acting on anything you see or hear here, first consult with your legal, with your tax, legal, or investment advisor. Thank you. And super exciting news. The I Love Terp shirts should be arriving at uh, some point you know, as we speak during this hour. A friend of mine who did it said he would be dropping them off. Uh, unfortunately, was not able to get here in time for me to be sporting one for this live. But um, potentially, we may be getting a uh, knock on the door from my wife or kids with some shirts, possibly, if they're not too shy to open the door and get themselves on screen for, for a quick moment. Um, all right, so with tax deferred accounts, uh, and again, you know, as always, post questions, comments along the way, there is a bit of a lag with when I see them. Um, and depending how much of a role I'm on, I may not be uh, responding to them immediately, but I will do my best to get to them. Um, for anyone who's 59 and a half or older, you may not care uh, about this, this live. You're more than welcome to stick around, obviously, and, and hopefully learn something um, and, and hear some good dad jokes. But otherwise, this only applies to people who are under, uh, who are not yet 59 and a half and have tax deferred accounts. Specifically, I'll be talking about IRAs for the most part, uh, make a few comments about employer plans at the end. But you know, if and when you take money out of those plans prior to age 59 and a half, there's always tax when you take money out in, in almost every case. Um, but you take it out, take money out prior to 59 and a half, there's also a 10% early withdrawal penalty on the amount you take out. Now there's a few forms of distributions or withdrawals from such accounts that are neither taxed nor subject to the 10% penalty. For example, if you roll an account over, um, you know, from one IRA, one tax deferred vehicle to another tax deferred vehicle, there's no tax, no, there's no penalty. That money's still staying within the tax deferred wrapper that, that it's in, so, so all is good. Also, when you uh, split money subject to a divorce, um, you know, and you have to transfer some money to your soon-to-be uh, ex-spouse, that transfer out of your IRA to his or her IRA is not a taxable or penalized distribution. Um, one other exception where it's not taxed or penalized is if you make an excess contribution. So for example, um, you contribute to a regular IRA. Typically it's, uh, you know, as long as your income is within certain limits, it's deductible. Uh, and I had a bad example. Let me do a different example. So you can only contribute $6,000 this year to an IRA or $7,000 if you're, if you're 50 or older. What if you mistakenly contribute 8,000 just because you forgot? I don't know. You know, you did a, you did 2000 bucks early in the year. You forgot about it. And later in the year, you did another six. Um, you can take that out and you should, you can take it out before the tax returns due date. So if you over contribute in 2020, you can take out the excess up through April 15th, 2021, assuming there's not some other you know crazy uh, COVID extension to the filing date next year, like there was this year, you can take that money out, the excess out prior to uh, April 15th. Removal of that excess is not uh, a taxable or um, uh, you know, there's no penalty for doing that. It's just simply, you shouldn't have put it there in the first place. So you get a freebie to, to take it out. So those are when there's no taxes and no, um, uh, penalty. Otherwise, if you're younger than 59 and a half, there will always be tax when you take money out. 
and there will always be a 10% penalty except in nine cases. And I'm going to go through the nine cases today. These are the nine exceptions. Um, for anyone interested in all the gory details, you can further read about this in IRS publication 590-B. Um, it, it's pretty lengthy, but uh, this is where I got it all from. This is basically the source for this information. So if you're interested in digging in more, you can, you can go there. Uh, so no magic, that, that's where I got this stuff from. Um, special treat, I wanted to pretend like I am David Letterman a little bit. And so I put these on index cards, kind of like his top 10 list. My writing is horrendous. Um, apologies. I have the writing of a, of a third grader and even that's being generous, but I will, you know, walk through these verbally as I'm explaining them. So like Letterman would do, you know, the top nine exceptions to the IRA 10% early withdrawal penalty from our home office in Butte, Montana. Uh, I need a Paul Schaefer or something here as a sidekick or better yet an Ed McMahon. So when I say something, he's like, ha ha, yes, sir. Ha ha. That would be great. I should really look into getting some sort of a hype man or sidekick for these, for these weekly things. Um, all right, let me, before I get into these nine, let me see any good comments or questions here. Kenan asked, why do they pick 59 and a half? What is the significance? I don't know. Um, I thought about that before for whatever reason, I, I don't think I looked into it or if I did, I, I didn't find an answer. Um, at least not a good one. So I don't know. I would hope there's some sort of significance. But frankly, I don't know. That's a, that's a great question, Kenan. Uh, I don't know. Um, another question. Do you only have to take out the excess contribution or, or also the return on it? Uh, yeah, I think you need... So if you do contribute too much to an IRA or Roth IRA... Now, I, I think it's only the... Uh, that's a good one. So I feel like the proper answer should be you need to take out the excess contribution and any returns on it. But I'm questioning myself because I could swear I heard on um, Jim Saulnier's podcast, the Retirement and IRA show that, that I talk about a lot and who I'm still trying to get to come on as a special guest. I could have swore he said at one point that you can sort of game things because, or maybe it's just with over Roth contributions, perhaps. It may not be IRA contributions, but he said you can like intentionally overfund something. Like hypothetically, if you knew some investment was going to rocket in price, you can intentionally overfund your, your account. Roth, Roth account, I think it was. Invest in this, whatever it is. Assume it, the price rockets up, so you have a bunch of gains, but then you gotta you know, pull out your excess contribution. I could have swore he said you can pull out just the excess contribution, but leave any gains attributable to that excess contribution in the account. Um, so it's my way of saying I'm not entirely sure, uh, Canon. I, I can look that up. Um, two years ago, I did have a situation where a tax return client where uh, he did over contribute to a Roth IRA and we just closed the account completely. So we took everything out, the contribution and the gains. Um, but I don't know if you can, in theory, just take out the contribution and leave the gains. You may be able to. All right. Uh, Mavis, yes, I need a clever sidekick. sidekick. Are you interested, Mavis? Um, you're good at the GIF game, the GIF game. So uh, maybe you make a good sidekick. That'd be cool. We can do some sort of live, like parallel screen zoom thing. Um, anyway, so let me know, Mavis, if you're interested. Um, the nine exceptions to the 10% early withdrawal penalty from an IRA, if you're under 59 and a half. Number one, unreimbursed medical expenses in excess of seven and a half percent of your AGI. That's a really sloppy looking greater than and seven, but uh, yeah. So to the extent you have unreimbursed medical expenses and those expenses exceed seven and a half percent of your AGI, you can take out money from your IRA to pay for the amount of those unreimbursed expenses in excess of seven and a half percent of your AGI. Again, you'd have to pay tax on those withdrawals as you will for all nine of these things, but there's no 10% penalty. Um, so that's one, that's one uh, exception. Cody's saying here, to avoid the 6% tax on excess contributions, you must withdraw the excess contribution from your IRA by the due date of your individual and any income earned on the excess. Yeah, so that, okay, so that's your IRA. Does the same hold true for Roth IRA, Cody? Um, not to put you on the spot, but if you, if you can happen to come across that, because I know the Jim Saulnier show, I could have swore he was talking about Roth. So to the extent Roths are treated differently than IRAs, um, maybe you can keep the gains in, but it appears based on what Cody said now, with a traditional IRA at least, uh, you cannot leave the gains in on the excess. That needs to come out too. All right, so that was number one. The number two exception to the 10% early withdrawal penalty, paying for medical premiums during your unemployment. 
Uh, so like if you get laid off and you are on COBRA, you can use withdrawals from your IRA to pay for those premiums. Again, you'll have to pay tax on it, but you'll not have to pay a 10% penalty. Now there's a few conditions here. Uh, you, you can't just like leave your job and say, hey, I'm unemployed. Um, the IRS publication says you need to be on unemployment. You need to be receiving unemployment for at least 12 consecutive weeks after, after you're let go or fired or whatever. Um, then after that 12 weeks of continuous unemployment res, uh, uh, payment, then you can use this withdrawal, this uh, you know, non-penalized non withdrawal to pay for your premiums for your health care, uh, such as COBRA, or such as whatever, ACA or something like that. Um, so that was number two. Uh, other questions. Shook says, will you be covering the exception rule for tax over three years for early withdrawal this year due to COVID-19? That's a good one. Um, uh, uh, I, I wasn't planning on it, but I should. Now, now that you say that, that's a good point. Um, let me save that till the end, uh, Shook. So that'll be number 10 um, about the COVID tax on COVID uh, withdrawals. Good point. All right, so that was number two, paying medical premiums after re because you're unemployed, but only after you have 12 consecutive weeks of unemployment. Number three, if you are totally and permanently disabled, you can take what, what in my reading is unlimited uh, withdrawals and distributions from your IRA. Again, all will be taxed, but no 10% penalty. Um, now, what qualifies as being permanently in, uh, or totally and permanently disabled? The IRS does have specific language. Uh, you need to be specifically um, you can't be able to do any substantial or any substantially gainful activity, however that's defined. You also need to be certified by a doctor that the disability is intended to result in death or at least be like long and pro, uh, whatever. Basically, um, basic negligible chance of it, of this disability ever going away. So you need to be that level of totally and permanently disabled. If and when you are, unfortunately, then you can take withdrawals from your IRA earlier than age 59 and a half without paying the 10% uh, penalty. So that's number three. Number four, this one's kind of weird. Um, I, I, I wouldn't personally put this in the same list of nine, but the IRS does. A beneficiary IRA. So if you inherit an IRA, you're under 59 and a half, and you inherit an IRA from someone who had died, doesn't matter what age they are, the point is you're under 59 and a half when you get that IRA inherited. You're allowed to withdraw. It'll always be taxed again, but there's no penalties. Whether you receive that IRA at 10 years old or 40 or 50 or 58 or whatever, you can take the money out basically whenever without any 10% penalty. Now, um, the reason why I feel like this shouldn't be in the same list because it's not like it's not really your IRA. Technically, when you inherit an IRA from someone else, it's still that other person. It's still the decedent's IRA uh, in name, even though that person has left the planet. It's still theirs. You are just the recipient of all of the income to come out of the IRA when you're the beneficiary. Now, the big exception is if you're a spouse and you inherit an IRA from your spouse, you can fold that into your own and, and truly make it your own IRA. For everyone else, you, you can't take an inherited IRA and consider it your own. It's always still going to be the decedents. You're just the one who's going to receive the income from it. So anyway, so if you inherit an IRA, there is no tax, uh, I'm sorry, no 10% penalty on the distributions from it whenever you choose to do that. Um, okay, thanks, Cody. So Cody clarifying that it does appear that you do need to take out earnings on excess contributions and not just take out excess contributions. Uh, thank you, Cody. <clears throat> All right, so that's number number four. Number five, this one gets a little little uh, hairy. So there's something called a substantially equal periodic payment. Um, basically, you, you kind of almost annuitize your IRA. So let's say you're, I don't know, you're 50 years old, you're in a bind, you really need the money. Um, yeah, you can take out a lump sum if you want. You're going to pay tax on it, but you also have a 10% penalty, assuming you don't qualify for any other uh, uh, of these exemptions. Um, you just need the money because you need the money for whatever. One of the ways you can do it is this substantially equal periodic payments, otherwise known as SEPP or SEP, not to be confused with SEP IRA, which is SEP. That's something completely different. But this is, there's three different options to, in effect, kind of uh, make an annuity out of your IRA. It's not really an annuity because there's no insurance company involved that you're buying a product from. So it's, it's, that's a bit of a misnomer. But sort of fundamentally what's happening is you're taking out payments. Uh, they can either be fixed or they can be variable. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But you have to take them for a certain amount of time. 
you need to take it for the for uh, either five years or until you turn 59 and a half. Um, and then you can stop that payment plan, but you can't stop it up until then. So for example, you're 50 years old, you need money in your IRA, you don't wanna pay a 10% penalty. So you can do one of three SEPP options from your IRA, substantially equal periodic payments. Two of those three methods, it's truly the same amount of payment and you need to take a payment at least every year. You can't do it like once every four years. It needs to be at least every year to qualify for this. Um, without getting into too much of the gory details, the two, Fixed payment methods have loosely similar processes. It's, it's based on some uh, given interest rate at the time and one of two different choices of factors. One is like an age-based, one is a life expectancy-based. Um, depending which method you use, you're gonna get a slightly different payment, but the point is it's gonna say, okay, on your $100,000 IRA balance, and, and I'm making this up, I have no idea if this is accurate, you can take out, um, or, or you have to take out, call it $5,000 a year for at least five years or until you turn 59 and a half. Um, if you do that and you actually take receipt of those payments every year, you're gonna be taxed, but there'll be no 10% penalty. Once you hit 59 and a half, you can now stop this payment plan and be like, I don't need the money anymore, cut it out, boom, done, you're good. Uh, it sounds decent in theory, but there's a lot of gotchas. Once you're on one of these plans, again, you need to ride it out for at least five years or until you're 59 and a half, whatever is greater actually so if you're if you're 58 and you start one of these plans it's only a year and a half to go until you're 59 and a half uh, even once you turn 59 and a half you still need to ride that plan out for another three and a half years because it needs to be the greater of five years or um, until you turn 59 and a half you generally can't change your payment plan once you're on it so you're, you're 50 you start this plan it says you need to take out five grand a year two years in you get a job you don't need these IRA monies anymore tough luck you got to keep taking it uh, if you break it, then the payments you took, you have to retroactively go back and pay, you know, penalty on the stuff you did take out already. There's one exception where they do let you change. You can change from either of the two fixed payment options to the third option, which is called, it's like an RMD, a required minimum distribution based option. Um, the difference is the payment will not be fixed every year. It'll be kind of variable and it's based on whatever your account balance is each year times some age based distribution factor. So that age-based factor changes a bit every year, as does your, your um, account balance every year. Therefore, your resulting payment amount every year will be different. But same thing, if you're on that, you need to keep taking that for at least five years or until you turn 59 and a half, whatever is greater. If you break it, uh, you, you gotta retroactively pay um, you know, the 10% penalty on, on the stuff that you already took. All right, um, we'll stop there for now. I see some questions. Canon asks, does the disability only apply to your current line of employment? i.e. someone who is an auto mechanic and then after the disability becomes a software engineer. Um, no, I think it's like you can't do any substantially gainful activity or employment, so you can't work at all. Um, I, I, I don't have a particular case that I'm aware of or, you know, or a situation that this is it, but in effect it's like you can't work at all. Um, you, you probably even have trouble just supporting yourself you know, with daily functions and stuff like that that's permanently totally disabled. It's not just, I can't do this job and now I can do a desk job where it's less physical. Um, I'm almost certain that um, that, that wouldn't qualify, uh, Ken, and it's totally and permanently disabled. You know, think about as extreme as you could situation of disability that's intended to la or expected to last until death. That's, that's what qualifies. Um, Jackie says, I've been researching this SEP and it's way more flexible than I originally thought. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I don't know what you originally thought, Jackie, but it's flexible in that there's three different payment options. It's flexible in that if you choose one of the two fixed payment options, you can later flip to the RMD option. Um, right. But you can't go from the RMD option to the fixed options. So there's a little bit of flexibility there and it's flexible in that you only need to do it five years or until you're 59 and a half. Um, but otherwise, once you're on the plans, like assume you're, you're kind of you know, you're wed to it until it's five years or 59 and a half. So, you know, depending how you view flexibility and what your, your baseline assumption was about this, Jackie, uh, it may or may not be um, yeah, more flexible than, uh, you know, than originally anticipated. Shook asks, does, does not beneficiary end up paying 37% inherited from trusts now due to the CARES Act? Um, good question, a little off topic for, for today's uh, thing within the group there's been a handful of posts about why 
tax deferred accounts should not have a trust or your estate named as one of the uh, named as one of the beneficiaries you should name the specific individuals directly on the beneficiary forms as the beneficiaries because if the tax deferred account flows through a trust on its way to the ultimate beneficiaries depending how that trust is structured yes maybe the trust will have to pay 37 percent tax on, on basically the entirety of the ira before it doles it out to the beneficiaries um, there are some trusts structured to do it in a way that doesn't that it's not taxed to the trust but uh, let me leave it there i can talk for more than i should about that topic but um that's more of an estate planning question and a trust question my general view is you should not name trusts or your estate as any form of beneficiary to your IRAs or 401ks or 403bs. Name individuals directly. Skip your trust, skip your will, whatever. It's cleaner, simpler, more direct. Definitely safer from a, from a potential tax bomb perspective to just name beneficiaries directly. Shook. <clears throat> um, Jackie says, can you use the SEP for just one IRA, not all of them, as an aggregate? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm inclined to say you'd have to do it based on all of them. Um, generally speaking, like with RMDs, for example, Jackie, it doesn't matter if you have one IRA or 10, it's your cumulative balance that the IRS looks at when they key figures off of your IRA. So you can't game it by putting like 2000 bucks into one IRA and having 500,000 in another one. I'm pretty confident in saying that you're going to almost certainly have to look at the combined IRA balance. I don't know that for, for certain, but that's that's my educated guess. Uh, I, I think it's probably probably accurate. Uh, yep, so Cody's using some insurance speak here. Yeah, the totally and permanently disabled is unlike own occupation. So when you get disability insurance, there's different definitions of disability. Some is like, we'll pay you if you can't do um, any job Others are like, we'll pay you if you can't do your job, but you can still do other jobs. Obviously, it'd be better to have that version as opposed to the version where you need to be like completely disabled, which is the uh, the definition that the IRS is, is using here. So thank you, Cody. All right, uh, so that was SEP. Let me move on for that. Um, frankly, I've never actually personally worked through a SEP uh, setup with someone, so I, I can't say firsthand that I've seen this in action. I've read about it. I know fundamentally how it works. Um, I have heard of people who have done the SEP thing. But you got it, you know, eyes wide open. You have to be aware of what its limitations and drawbacks are when you do it. Uh, don't don't just do this haphazardly. Definitely think this through before you uh, get yourself into one of these set plans. All right. <clears throat> the sixth exception, qualified higher education expenses, basically college or any other um, accredited qualified post-secondary. It could be a trade school, for example. It could be a public private school. It could be a for-profit school, even like um, uh, University of Phoenix or Strayer or, or any one of those. Um, it, and it's not just for you. It could be higher education expenses for you, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, or children or grandchildren of your spouse, if they're not your biological um, you know, children or grandchildren. And qualified higher education expenses, again, needs to be any, um, it's effectively any accredited post-secondary school. So college, university, public, private, trade schools count even. Um, the other thing to know, you, you can't double dip. So if you receive scholarship money that was tax-free or any portion of a scholarship that was tax-free that you got to pay for school, you can't also claim those same expenses that you paid with tax-free money. You can't also claim uh, an IRA withdrawal uh, exemption for that. Similarly, if you have like a Pell Grant or a Coverdale or anything else, any other sort of tax-advantaged form of money you use to pay for qualified education expenses, you can't double dip and also get this exemption uh, by, by similarly taking money out of your IRA. But assuming you don't have any of those, uh, you know, tax favored payments, scholarships, whatever, then yes, um, you can take money out of your IRA earlier than 59 and a half. You'll have to pay tax, but you will not have to pay a 10% penalty. Um, and I don't see there being any limit. In theory, this can be, you know, if you go to a school, private schools now, you know, pushing 80 grand a year. In theory, I, I do think you can pay $320,000 of education expenses out of your IRA without paying any of the 10% uh, early withdrawal tax. Uh, it's probably not a great idea. You know, if that's your only source of funds is your IRA and you're paying full freight to go to a school that's 80 grand a year, um, you know, <laughs> there's other things that need to be rethought and, you know, revisit the uh, decision of, of what school you're going to and why. But in theory, yes, I don't think there's a limit on the amount of money you can take out of your IRA 
under this qualified education expense uh, exemption. Um, and I see Jackie asked that. So yeah, okay, good. Looks like I already got to that question. So no, no limit that I'm aware of, uh, none listed in IRS publication 590B about there being a limit on education expenses, <clears throat> Jackie. Number seven, <clears throat> to buy, build, or rebuild your first home. A few caveats here. There is a $10,000 lifetime limit. If you're married, each of you and your spouse can, can do up to $10,000 withdrawal taxed, but penalty free from your IRA. So what does buy, build, or rebuild your first home? Y you can't have owned a primary residence or your primary residence in any of the, uh, in, in the last two years, and that, that goes for your spouse as well. Um, so let's, you don't, it doesn't need to truly be your first home. It just can't be, you can't have owned a primary residence in the last two years. So maybe you owned a home five years ago, but you sold it four years ago, fine. You've been renting for the last four years. Now you buy a house, you would qualify for this. But again, it's a $10,000 lifetime limit per person. So spouse will be, you know, 10,000 each. And it's not just your house. It's again, your house, your spouse's house, your child's house, your grandchild's house, your child or grandchild of your spouse, or the parents of you or your spouse. Um, you can take 10,000 bucks to pay for the first time buying, building, or rebuilding uh, the first time home for any of those folks. Still a tax, but no penalty. All right, uh, number eight, IRS levy or levy, levy, I guess, um, frown face. That's not cool. So the, you, owe, you owe the IRS money. They say, all right, you can't pay us. Forget you. We're taking it from your IRA. You don't have a choice. When the IRS comes knocking with a levy, they're going to do what you're going to do. Um, you can try to hire a tax attorney or like an enrolled agent to represent you to try to challenge it. But let's assume, you know, you, you don't win or whatever. The IRS comes knocking, they're, they're taking their money. Uh, the good news is they won't penalize you if you're under 59 and a half and they take your IRA money. You're still gonna have to pay tax, boo, but at least they're kind enough to not slap you with the penalty. That's an IRS levy, frowny face. And finally, the ninth exception to the 10% early withdrawal rule for IRAs, not employer plans yet, but IRAs, qualified reservist distribution. What does that mean? If you are in the military reserves and you are called to duty any point after September 11th, September 11th, 2001, not just any September 11th, but the September 11th, you're called to duty um, and you, your, your call or your tour, I'm not sure what, what the exact terminology is, is greater than 179 days, you can take distributions from your IRA during the time you're at duty um, without this 10% penalty. There appears to be no limit on this. So you can take out 5,000 bucks or 100,000 bucks. Um, once your duty, once your call or your, your tour or whatever it's called stops, you, you can't keep taking money out. It's only during that time you're called. And again, assuming your tour, your duty is at least, or is greater than 179 days. Um, that's a qualified reservist distribution. That's the ninth and final exception to the 10% early withdrawal penalty for IRAs. Any questions? This is not Ross. This is just, you know, Ross, we went over a handful of weeks ago. This is just traditional tax deferred IRAs. Cody says IRS levy from IRA still taxable hyphen burn. Yes, definitely burn. That's not cool. All right. Um, so that's IRAs. A couple other comments. 401ks, 403bs. You may have heard of the rule of 55. Um, if you haven't, I'm explaining what it is. So this does not apply to IRAs, but does apply to 401ks, 403bs. Keep in mind, just because the IRS says you can do it, and I'll explain what it is, just because the IRS says you can do it doesn't mean your employer will actually allow it. You need to check with your specific plan because employer plans could always be more restrictive than what the IRS allows. They can never be more aggressive or lenient, but they can always be more, more restrictive. Um, in my experience, most employer plans do seem to allow this, at least the larger ones. But uh, anyway, so rule of 55 is if you have a 401k at whatever company you're at and in the year you turn 55, you, you get, or later, so 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, um, you get laid off, fired, you voluntarily leave, or whatever circumstances, doesn't matter. If you have a separation of service in the year you turn 55 or later, and you keep that plan where it is, meaning you don't roll it to an IRA, once you roll it, you lose this right. But if you keep that plan at, at that previous employer, after you leave, you can take monies out penalty free. You're always taxed again, but you can bypass a 10% penalty. So this really only applies for four and a half years. It'll be when you're 55, 56, 57, 58, and the first half year, or I guess 59, and then 
a half year because once you're 59 and a half, the penalty goes away anyway. But for those handful of years in between, this could be, or this is one of the reasons why it could make sense to not roll over a 401k to an IRA after you leave an employer. Um, <clears throat> and th this only applies to the 401k of the employer whom you left when you were 55 or older. So for example, you leave one job when you're 40, you have a 401k there, you let that just sit there and bake. You get rehired somewhere else in that same year. So from the time you're 40 to when you're 56, let's say, you work at another company that has another 401k. You leave that second employer, get fired, whatever, it doesn't matter. You can do this rule of 55 withdrawal from that second employer's 401k. You cannot do it from the first one that you left when you were 40. You need to depart the employer in the year you're 55 or older um, for this rule of 55 to, for you to take advantage of it. Um, cool? So, and as I mentioned, once you roll it, you lose that right. So let's say you leave at 56. You choose to roll that 401k over to your IRA. You lost the ability to do that rule of 55. Um, now, th this can get a little uh, strategy e. but let's say you start working somewhere else at 57. They have a 401k. Well, guess what? Maybe they'll let you roll back in IRA money. You then leave the next year at 58. Now you have that money in your 401 that you can then take out of. So if you know, if you do go back to work and whatever, you can kind of plan around and maybe get yourself some penalty free access to that money. But generally speaking, uh, for people who, who stop working after 55 and don't go back, uh, if you need access to that money, it's worth considering leave it in your old employer plan as opposed to rolling into 401. And that applies for 401ks and 403bs. Again, the IRS allows it, but the plan may not. Check with your employer, you know, with your plan uh, if they allow it. Um, Shook says, can you just set up payment plans with IRS instead of levy. Uh, yeah, so the IRX is fairly flexible with plan. They just want their money. However, you're willing and able to get that to them, great. Um, you know, I would ideally think you'd want it to. I mean, I guess it depends on your circumstances, but sure. If you have the funds in a checking account or, you know, from wages or future paychecks, whatever, you can set up a payment plan. But worst case, you know, if you say, forget it, I'm not paying you, or I don't have a job, or you don't have any other assets other than an IRA, they'll come after that. So, but yes, if you can get around it, sure, they'll take money however they can get it. But if you leave them no option and tap in your IRA is their only option, that's what that's when the IRS levy is gonna come into play, uh, Shook. Great question. Kenan asked, does the rule of 50, I assume the rule of 55, does it apply to 401A and 403B only? What about 457? Uh, frankly, I don't know much about 457 plans. I think in general they should be allowed because I believe, don't quote me, I believe they're all loosely treated the same. There are some differences I remember coming across in my studies throughout the years. But uh, assume it's hypothetically possible, but the answer is always going to be check with your employer slash plan administrator. They will have the definitive answer as to whether or not they allow it. Again, even if the IRS does, your plan may not because they choose not to. Jackie asked, but what about TSP? Yes, um, TSP allows it, I believe, I think. I'm fairly certain. Uh, I don't know for a fact. I'm going to say 80% confident, Jackie, that TSP does allow Rule 55. Now, there's one, there's one twist. Um, there's also something called the Rule 50. So and this may only apply to 403Bs, possibly 457s. Um, if you are a public safety employee, uh, certain types of public safety employees, you can do this rule of 55 game at 50. So if you leave that employer 50 or later, you can get uh, penalty free access to the money that's in your plan, assuming you leave it in your plan. Now I did jot down uh, what specifically qualifies as these public safety employees. It's specified federal law enforce, enfor enforcement officers. So that implies not all of them, just specified ones. Uh, this is again, right from IRS publication 590B. Customs and Border Protection Officers, Federal Firefighters and Air Traffic Controllers. Um, I don't think that's it. I think those are additions that they added in recent years. So to me, public safety employee, you know, I assume it's police, firefighters, uh, whatever. It sounds like these other ones are special additions that they added again. So federal law enforcement officers, Customs and Border Protection, Federal Firefighters and Air Traffic Controllers. So again, check with your plan. If all you know, if, if there's any questions, check with your plan to what they can do. Um, if you do work in a position that you, you believe is a public safety position, 
check and see if the rule of 50 applies to you. If it does, that's potentially a, a valuable tool to have if you need early access to those funds between age 50 and 59 and a half. Um, so these employer plans have some, uh, so someone, uh, Brenda asked about the COBRA distribution. Yes, um, I'll come back to that. That's, that was the last uh, point I wanna to touch on. So these four employer plans like 401ks, 403bs have this additional potential benefit of rule 55 or rule 50. But unlike IRAs, there's some other exceptions that they do not have. So for example, um, 403bs uh, and 401ks do not have the qualified higher education expense uh, exemption. They do not have the first time home buyer expense exemption. Um, but they may have other things like you can take loans from often, check with your plan, but you can typically take loans from a 401k or 403b. You cannot take loans from your IRA. So that's another benefit of a, a 401k or 403b. There's also potentially hardship distributions. Uh, there's no such hardship distribution in an IRA. I mean, there are specific things that you can argue would qualify as a hardship, you know, loss of job, totally permanently disabled, whatever, but there's no blanket sort of hardship distribution uh, in IRAs, but you may have that in, um, in employer plans like, like 401ks, 403bs. Um, all right, so that's almost it. Other than the COVID thing, let me just see what other questions there are. So Cody says, also be aware of the 20% mandatory federal income tax withheld when it's distributed from the 401k, uh, other than in 2020 with COVID rules. Uh, right, good point, Cody. So yeah, excellent point, actually. So when you have an IRA and you, you know, it's going to be at some broker, Vanguard, Fidelity, TD, Schwab, wh whoever, wherever, it doesn't matter. You request the distribution. You have the discretion to say how much tax you want withheld, if any and paid to the federal government. It could be zero, could be 100, could be anywhere in between. Now, some brokers may limit you to a certain 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever, um, but I know you can go from zero to 100. Uh, I, I'm actually just talked to, to a client last week who, uh, long story short, normally takes RMDs and has her federal taxes withheld solely from that, and that covers all the rest of her taxes. Because there's no RMD this year, she didn't take a payment and just realized, oops, I'm not paying any tax this year because of that. So she called up and wanted to know what to do. So we ended up doing a, an IRA distribution, a voluntary IRA distribution, where we withheld 100% as tax, which means that whole thing goes straight to the government as tax. Um, so anyways, the point is you can control tax withholding in IRAs. 401ks, you can't. It's mandatory. They will withhold 20%. Uh, I don't think you can get away with doing less, and I don't think you have an option to do more. I could be wrong. Uh, maybe some plans allow otherwise, but the default assumption is you take a 401k distribution, 20% will be withheld um, federally. Keep that in mind. Uh, Shook says you got to have to be with the most current employer 401k for the 55 rule. Yes, exactly. So again, you leave a job when you're 40, you can't go back and tap that plan uh, after you're 55. It needs to be the employer where you leave in the year you're 55 or older in order to take advantage of the rule of 55 or rule of 50 if you're uh, public public safety. Um, all right, so COVID. So under the CARES Act, which came out in March, which is the stimulus relief laws meant to uh, provide economic and fiscal support uh, to the country, to people, to, to employers uh, as a result of, or due to the pandemic and its economic impacts. One of the things they allow is a um, one hundred thousand dollar. I think about this. It's it's basically a loan, if you will. So you can you can take out up to one hundred thousand dollars from your four hundred one k. You can pay the tax on that over three years. So let's assume the tax is going to be uh, twenty thousand bucks. Let's make it even uh, twenty one thousand dollars you can pay $7,000 per year in tax. So you take the whole hundred out now, you can use it if you want. Um, you'll have to pay 21,000 in tax total, but you can stretch that out over three years. So $7,000 per year. Now this isn't entirely ironed out. We won't know until the IRS releases the uh, 2020 form 1040 to see how mechanically this tax repayment or this tax payment thing is actually gonna happen. But the point is the relief is they're letting you take you know, potentially a large amount of money out of your 401 and stretch the tax bill out over three years, as opposed to having to pay it all. Normally you have to pay it all in the year you take the distribution. Now you can stretch it out over three years. But here's the rub. 
you're allowed to also put that money back. So let's say you take 100 out and fast forward six months, like, ooh, I don't really need this, I got another job. So now you can put that 100 back into your plan. Um, you know, what if you pay tax already for that? Now, not the end of the world, you'll uh, presumably, when you file your tax return, you'll get that, that tax you paid back as a refund because you will have paid too much tax. Um, what if you pay tax this year and don't put the 100,000 back until two years from now? Then what happens? I don't know. I haven't thought through it and I don't know if the IRS has. If they have, I haven't you know, read all the, all the details about what their guidance is. But um, they're trying to be nice. They're trying to let you take out a potentially large amount of money from your 401. Um, you can pay the tax over three years instead of one year, but they'll let you put it back if you don't need it. So this can complicate things with the taxation of it. Uh, so, and there's no 10% penalty to that. That's, I, that's an important point I should have said, sorry. There's no 10% penalty. You can take it out, use it, not use it, put it back, whatever. Uh, you will have to pay tax if you do end up keeping it out, but you have three years to, to change your mind uh, and, and put it back. Um, do you, you have three years to pay the tax. I don't know if you have three years to change your mind. Uh, I'm a little fuzzy on that. Maybe you have to put it back this year if you choose to put it back. Uh, if you don't, you have three. You definitely have three years to pay the tax. I don't know if you have three years to change your mind to put the money back or if you only have one year. Uh, TBD. And Brenda, Brenda, so it has to be paid back. No, it doesn't. Um, this is where it's confusing. Uh, they, they give you the option to put it back if you don't want to. But if you, if you want or need the money, you want to take it out and spend it, you can. You can take it out. You'll have to pay tax, but you can stretch the tax over three years. There's no 10% penalty, but you can definitely spend it, use it, whatever. You do not have to put it back. But if you want to put it back, you can. And again, the, the scenario was, let's assume you lost your job due to COVID. Um, your knee-jerk reaction is, I need money. So you take this 100 grand out of your 401k because the CARES Act allows you. You get a new job in six months and realize, ooh, wow, okay, that's cool. Uh, I guess I don't need this money. You can put the money back. And, and you probably would, you hopefully would, in a situation like that where you, you get other employment. So they're trying to be flexible and kind with this CARES Act, but it's gonna make things confusing. Um, for people who do put it back, but already paid the tax, it could be kind of messy. But no, you do not have to pay it back. You can if you want, but you don't have to, uh, Brenda. Good, good point, good question. Um, all right, <clears throat> so that's it. So uh, relatively short, yeah, Cody said most people will not put it back. Yeah, I, I, would, assume, <laughs> I would assume probably not. Um, who knows? Maybe you would, but if you took it out, you're probably like, oh, whatever. I already took it out. Let me let me go do something with it. Hopefully, you do something fiscally responsible, as opposed to just throw it in your you know your general cash pot and, and go spend it um, when you otherwise wouldn't have spent it. Uh, so Shooks asked, can you pay it back by year three so you don't have to pay tax or do amended return then? Yeah, that, that's what I don't know, um, and and I don't know if the IRS has thought that through thoroughly enough. Shook, that's a good good point. Um, I, I don't know if you can wait. So let's say you do take it and you hold it for three years. And then in the third year, you decide to pay it back. I think the intention was you were supposed to have been paying the tax equally in thirds in each of the three years you had the distribution in your hand. Um, I don't know for certain, but I, I believe that was the intention of the law. Again, we won't know for sure until the IRS comes up with the 2020 uh, form 1040, which won't be until like, you know, January-ish, um, then we'll know for sure. And even then they still might not have it ironed out. They, you know, they, they can revise stuff. But as of now, I believe you have to pay a third of the tax each year, which then begs the question, if in year three, you put the whole $100,000 back, what do you do? Well, I think you would then have to issue amended returns for the two prior years to get back the excess tax you paid in those two years. That's how I think things would happen now. But again, TBD, how this, how this, how this, how this ultimately uh, plays out, Shook. But you're raising great points, and these are legitimate concerns and questions that uh, there aren't definitive answers to yet um, from the IRS. Uh, so Shook's also asking, you put it back with after-tax money. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so money is fungible. So if you take out $100,000 from your from your 401k under this CARES Act provision and you plop it into your checking account, it's now sitting in the after-tax world. You need to pay the tax. Again, assume it's equally in thirds over three years. You're paying that tax with after-tax money, if you will. 
because um, again, money is fungible. It doesn't matter if you have 100,000 from your IRA and 100,000 from other cash sitting in your checking account, you have 200,000 bucks, cash is cash. If and when you decide to put the money back, yes, you're gonna write a check from your checking account or savings account or wherever. So that's after tax money, if you will, because it's just money hanging out in your account. Um, if that makes sense. So cash is fungible. Once there's cash in your checking account, it, I don't want to say it doesn't really matter where it came from. At that point, it's just after tax cash, right? You're separately paying the tax and your tax returns over the course of three years. If you take one of these special uh, COVID COVID related distributions or, or coronavirus related distributions. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so that's it. That, that's it for the comments and questions. So Thank you all. This is one of the shorter ones. I suspected it would be, um, you know, anyone over 59 and a half probably doesn't care about any of this stuff at this point and rightfully so. But for those of you that were here and asked questions, thank you. Uh, great questions, comments. Hopefully you all got something out of this. Um, I will see you next week. I will have my I Heart Terp shirt on next week because they should be upstairs now. Uh, so, so I'm told. Next week's topic will be all about charitable giving, specifically how to do it in the most uh, tax efficient way possible. So until then, I'll see you next week and have a good one. Take care.